Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, you shouldn't mistake it for the Center of Internet and Society. That is completely different. Uh, we are just the Center for Internet and Society. Uh, today we have a talk by an embarrassingly young man, <laughs> given his accomplishments. He is only uh, uh, 30 years old. Uh, when I saw his birthday announced on Facebook, it upset me. As a 40-year-old, I have not managed uh, to garner such a significant pool of uh, accomplishments. So it upset me to learn that Smari is finally 30 years old. He is uh, somebody I would like to grow up and become. <laughs> he is a successful technology hacker. You can give him complicated uh, technology projects and he can get his hands dirty and uh, hack at technology, write code. And he's also an accomplished policy hacker. He has worked on important policy issues and has actually managed to transform uh, the world that he exists in. Unlike uh, my organization, we've tried really hard <laughs> for the last five years working on the Indian IT Act and we've made almost no progress. So, uh, uh, two important things about Smari to remember, that he's a technology hacker and a policy hacker. Uh, the story of crowdsourcing Iceland's constitution and the future of democracy, that's what the talk is about. So I'm not going to focus on that story. I'll focus on uh, two other stories that will hopefully give you some sense of the man. Uh, the first is a story from... Uh, Spring and summer 2010. And if you watch the film, We Steal Secrets, <laughs> uh, you will see this story in the film. We Steal Secrets. Yeah, that's it. Uh, this is the film of uh, Julian Assange and the WikiLeaks project. And uh, over the spring and summer of the year 2010, uh, Julian Assange uh, came to Iceland twice and spent a lot of time with Smari and other activists in Iceland and they were uh, working around two releases of key documents. Uh, the first was the helicopter video uh, from Iraq. Uh, that was the first video that they worked on. And the second was uh, the documents, uh, was it the diplomatic cables? Uh, that was much later. Much later. Uh, it was the Afghan war logs. The Afghanistan war logs, which were uh, provided to Julian Assange by Chelsea Manning. Uh, both these documents needed a lot of work before they could be placed in the public domain. And uh, Smari was a uh, project manager, <laughs> uh, working with this large team of uh, people, including Julian Assange, on uh, redacting documents and producing the necessary publicity material. So that's uh, an important part of his introduction. Since then, he got onto the FBI's radar, and every time <laughs> he goes to the US, uh, they come and have conversations with him. And maybe he will tell you about those uh, conversations. Uh, the uh, second part of his introduction that I want to focus on is that he's the founder of the Pirate Party in Iceland. Uh, he founded that party somewhere in 2012. Uh, early, early parts of 2012? Uh, late. Late parts of yeah. 2012. In the 2013 elections, uh, the Pirate Party uh, uh, stood for elections. They won three seats in the Iceland parliament. Smari, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately. Did, or fortunately <laughs> did not win. Uh, the uh, margin uh, was 100 votes. He lost by 100 <laughs> votes. If he had got 100 more votes, then he would be an MP today. And oh, uh, yes, that would be horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we wouldn't have the privilege of listening to him. Uh, so he's a dear friend, and uh, I'm uh, very envious of everything he's done. And I keep uh, hoping that one day I will become as accomplished as he is. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy this presentation. Over to Swami. Thank you. Thanks uh, for very long and slightly inaccurate at times <laughs> introduction. 
<laughs> no, um, but I, I do disagree. Uh, the things that you built here, Sunil, are amazing. So you know, I've, I've liked your work for a long time. But uh, I'm going to try and talk a bit about the future of democracy. But in order to talk about that, we kind of need to start with what's wrong with it. Why, why does, you know, um, what problems might we have? And, you know, let's first paint a picture. Now, it's early on election day, the sun's shining, you know, mostly cloudless sky, and, and there's lots of voters kind of hitting the polls early, you know, waking up early, going to the polling stations, you know, and then going for walks in the park afterwards and getting ice cream and, and whatnot. And, and, you know, many of the older voters are wearing their best clothes, and, you know, the younger people just showed up with whatever they were wearing that day. And, and you know, some of these people look more relaxed. They, they know that their party is going to win. And, um, you know, and in particular, those who are more wealthy looking, they, they look very relaxed. And, you know, uh, the season's hairstyles are all uh, all there, you know, all in attendance. And, you know, um, there are a variety of patterns and colors that people are wearing. And, and really, personal choices are, you know, uh, they're bound in this kind of sea of, of democratic tranquility. Um, you know, enthusiastic voters, they're, they're curtained, you know, entering the curtain booths and, and they're optimistically placing a cross, you know, in one of the, one of the check boxes in, on, the, on the ballot sheet. And they, you know, and he steps out and having fo carefully folded the, the ballot to speci uh, spe uh, specification, you know, by the regulation, and smiles and, at the polling officer as he slips it into the box. So, in re religion of democracy, because we do treat it somewhat religiously, putting the X in the box is kind of the most sacred uh, ritual. Uh, and what the elementary school, which can, becomes a co uh, polling station, lacks in, in kind of majesty and splendor, it makes up for with its carthetic um, depth of significance, kind of, um, you know, in, in this religion, we don't chant except at rallies. We, we don't pray except on voters. Um, we don't repent ever. Uh, but the mathematics, if people look at them, don't really make everybody lose their faith. Because not only is democracy a system of governance, it's a set of technologies. It's, it includes methods of, of organizing and operating debates, it, it, voting systems and balloting mechanisms and and it includes the bureaucracy and the parliaments and, uh, you know, and all sorts of trade agreements and things like that. And it includes every aspect of how we make decisions as a society. It's a very impressive set of technologies that affect our lives a lot more than, than most other technologies that we live with. But we very rarely talk about them as technologies. Right? And there's various versions of these technologies. They vary from country to country, from, from region to region. Um, there's this, this wonderful uh, tendency in, in kind of uh, electoral system design where uh, if you live on one side of the English Channel, everything, t uh, or you know, in the US, uh, the Anglosphere, everything tends towards what's called first past the post uh, elections. But if you live on the other side of the English Channel, or basically in, in the smart side of the world, uh, I'm afraid to say, um, then, then you t uh, tend to go by uh, proportional representation systems. And you have all these kind of variants and all sorts of tweaks and, and differences in style. And some of them are really massive and other ones are really minute. But what unites all of these technologies really, is really just two facts. We really de recognize them, uh, rarely recognize them as, as technology. That was a bat. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we are very averse to innovation in it, right? It's something that people consider to be set in stone. But this isn't to say that, that innovation doesn't happen in, in democracy. You know, on the contrary, over the last centuries, and over you know, all the centuries since, since democracy was invented, we've had these massive improvements about how we run things. Uh, you know, most notably uh, following kind of the philosophical arguments uh, between the likes of uh, Hume and Mill and others in the, in the 19th century. Um, but also through other shifts in governments, some revolutionary, some evolutionary. And you know, the underlying models, despite all of this, 
have remained relatively static. They, they haven't really uh, adapted to changing situations as, as fast as the situations themselves have changed. And we have never actually, anywhere in the world, as far as I can tell, reviewed the concept of democracy as we do it today on a fundamental level. So modern democracy is predominantly representative. It's a system that can, you can trace it back 2,500 years, roughly. You might be able to trace it further some places, but, but generally that's where it seems to have started. And it served us really well. It has served us really well, like in many regards. But there's a lot of evidence that, that you know, it's reaching a breaking point. We see this in, in you know, uh, straining points coming up where the planet's population dynamics or, or the availability of near ubiquitous telecommunications at high speed are kind of putting all sorts of pressures on, on uh, representative democracies that we've never seen before. Um, and, you know, the sheer speed at which life is happening now is, is you know, suggesting to us that the technology of democracy is due for some rethinking. You don't have to look very far. You, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine right now is, is evidence of, of some kind of breakdown. The situation in Syria, the, the entire Arab Spring, and again and again and again throughout everything, um, you know, even here in India with uh, I've been following a bit the, uh, what's happening up in Delhi with the um, Atme party uh, quitting and resigning. Uh, they, you know, all of this is, is kind of evidence that something might be wrong. But if we wish to build effective systems of collective governance, we must be ready to learn a lot of, of pretty painful lessons about what it is that makes one system effective and, and another ineffective, right? Um, so we must be willing to, to delve down uh, into, into the murky depths and get our hands dirty a bit. Um, you know, build democratic theory and political theory and systems design and, and you know, uh, try and figure out what's wrong and what's right and what, what works and what doesn't. And this is where you know, Plato's warning uh, should really stand as testament, right? Uh, where, where he said, you know, one of the penalties, he didn't actually say it like this, I'm, uh, it's a fairly long paragraph, but I'll, I'll, I'll try and you know, shove it together. Uh, one of the penalties of, of refusing to participate in politics is that you end up being governed by an, your inferiors, right? So, as you might see, I like splitting things up into chapters. Uh, it might help you, and also I count down, so increasing the, the tension a bit. But, you know, you go to an election, you start off with your hopes and dreams, you pick the party that you dislike the least, right? And it's normally the one that represents about half of, of all of your hopes and dreams. And then you compromise the rest, knowing that it's your best option, right? And then you dutifully check that box, you know, participate in a religious ritual, uh, perhaps because the party, uh, you know, uh, that you really liked and believed in, isn't, they doesn't stand uh, an ice cream's chance in hell of, of actually getting, you know, getting into power. And, you know, then by magic, somehow, the party you voted for wins, right? At that point, some things start to happen. Because, um, you know, it's a coalition government. There's two or three parties making a government. And, and they, of course, have coalition negotiations, at which point they start to negotiate away, you know, their agenda, their, their platform. And suddenly you realize that, that even before they've actually formed a government, about another half of all of your hopes and dreams have been squandered, thrown away. And, oh, well, you know, you've got a quarter left, right? That's not too bad. But then reality kicks in, you know, the parliamentary session, the, um, you know, the, the term, and all of the pol politicians are arguing and pushing, and some are putting this bill in, some are putting that bill in, and, you know, by the end of the term, if you sit down and do the math on what actually got through that you cared about, you're pretty, you're going to be pretty happy if you got 5% of what you hoped for, you know, that would be a pretty good, uh, good situation. Because the doctrine of modern democracy, representative democracy, is compromise early, compromise often, right? You know, you, 
you bargain away your hopes and dreams as if it's a democratic discount emporium. You know? But really, if we analyze this a little bit further, you know, you get one vote, and it's allocated to you by your government. It's established through fiat. They basically create the vote out of nothing and give it to you. And you're required to invest it. You know, if we think of it as money for a moment, and you know, people feel very uncomfortable when you think about votes as money, um, for pretty good reasons, understandably. But um, you you have to invest it all on election day, and on one of the choices on the ballot sheet, right? And the investment term is for four years or five years, depending on your uh, constituency. You know, it might, might even be two in some cases. And um, you know, it's really a hedge on your part that society will improve as a result of you, you know, investing in this particular way. Uh, but the return on investment, you know, before you even cast a vote, the return on investment is going to be negative because we only get 5% if we're lucky. There's no liquidity. You can't subdivide your vote. You can't um, make multiple hedges and try and you know, uh, balance the game in any good way. You can't not compromise. And you know, it's you can you must play the game, but you cannot win. You cannot break even, and you cannot quit. And you know, it's really the second law of thermodynamics encoded into our system of governance. But you know, can we do any better? Well, so let's look at the numbers a bit. I, I like looking at numbers, forgive me. And actually, uh, if I'm starting to get too technical, you know, yell at me, you know, or throw things, that's fine. But, you know, okay, the year 1776 in the US, there were about uh, 2.5 million people total in the US, right? And they had a total of 65 representatives in the a, in a US House of Representatives, right? So that meant that there were about 38,600 odd people for each representative. And you know, for, yeah, so since then, the population has more than six, uh, no, than a uh, hundredfolded, right? It's, it's about 350 million now in that country. And the total number of representatives has gone up, but uh, it's currently um, 435 members in the House of Representatives. Uh, so that means that each of them is representing 721,000 people. That's about 19 times more than they were back when the country was founded. And other countries have similar figures. Uh, one of the ones I really like is San Marino. Uh, you know San Marino? It's a little city-state in Italy. And uh, it was founded as a, uh, as a democracy in the year 1243. Uh, and they've had the same 60-person parliament. Actually, they've switched up some of the people since then, but uh, the same 60-person parliament since, since that year. Uh, and, you know, it's, it hasn't grown, it hasn't changed, but back in, in you know, 1243, the population was about, you know, 500 to 700 people in that city-state. And now it's, uh, it's 32,000 people. So that means you have uh, about, what, uh, 65? increase in number of people per each representative so you know that's that's quite a big shift and one of the reasoning uh, like when we look at the reasoning for why um, democracy is done the way it's done uh, part of it comes down to this this line that uh, Thomas Hobbes wrote in, in the book Leviathan back in the 16, uh, 1600s um, he, he war warned that you know if uh, if there, we did not have strong centralized governance, uh, then everything would split up into a, a war of all against all, a bellum omnium contra um, You know, the, the big fight because he said uh, humans are too, um, uh, too flawed to be able to govern themselves. You know, we are no angels, he said. So therefore, we must have people who are better than us to control us. You know, so of course, we pick politicians, right? But historically, you know, parliaments and you know, political systems everywhere, they're, they're built around uh, the needs of certain elites. Um, these elites were the people who had the money, the, the workforce was theirs, the property was theirs, and the freedom to exercise the power. Uh, and, uh, you know, thanks to the parliamentary system, they, they had uh, the mechanism to, to exercise it in any which way they wanted. So parliamentary democracy has very different uh, origin stories in different countries. So, uh, but the common theme was 
you had the transition of power from, from monarchs and, and uh, emperors and so on down to this kind of upper class. And you know, slowly, slowly it moved down and uh, more and more people were emancipated. But you know, did it ever actually finish? Because, you know, I mean, okay, I, I'm from Iceland, right? Uh, and in Iceland, the parliament was established by the landowners who had settled the country. Um, you know, after having been kind of, uh, they fled the rule, they, they didn't really want to pay taxes to, to this Norwegian king, so that's why they fled Norway and settled in Iceland. And they, it was all the wealthy landowners who, who got to participate in the parliament, not the women, not the slaves, you know. And it's kind of similar, um, you know, in England, where where it was kind of the upper class, the the landowners, the the wealthy farmers who established the um, you know the parliament there uh, through the Magna Carta, where they basically forced King John to kind of accept, okay, you know, I'm not going to be entirely in control of everything anymore. And you know, wherever you go, if you look at Thailand, Thailand's an interesting example because it's one of the few countries, if it's if not the only country in uh, kind of East Asia that was never colonized by a Western country. And uh, you know, and, and their uh, their parliament was founded in 1932 following a bloodless coup. Uh, and really, you know, that was that was the first time they they transitioned. But if you look at who represents people in the parliament there today. It isn't the general public, it's, it's mostly the wealthy, the rich. So, you know, everywhere it's the same. You had a, powerful, a powerful upper, upper class of some kind that demanded political rights uh, from whoever was the, the historical master class. And, uh, but then they didn't pass the, the political rights on uh, to the lower classes except in a very small degree and always with a lot of arguments. And the, the requirement, you know, historically for physical presence in the parliament was uh, an unavoidable property for, uh, for a deliberative system back in the old days because we didn't have any method of telecommunications. So we had to just say, okay, um, you know, only those who have the, the ability to show up can really participate. So that's an exclusionary property because it means it enforced the power of the elites uh, because only they could travel. And, and it's interesting, actually, to, to think about who has the ability to travel today. You know, there, there is this weird jet-setting upper class, you know, people like me, I guess, who, who get to travel around the world, you know, whereas most people on the planet, you know, never really get to leave their, their home village or their, their city or, you know, get to go anywhere. So the, the entire political system is skewed uh, to benefit idiots like me. Sorry about that. <laughs> but, you know, but distance wasn't really the only exclusionary property. Uh, you, you, you know, parliaments, they, they operate on, on very inflexible schedules. Uh, the current uh, mode of parliamentary scheduling, you know, is based on agrarian annual cycles. So, um, you know, which was very useful several centuries ago because, you know, uh, when we, we had m mostly agrarian cultures, you know, everywhere. Uh, but, you know, um, you know, the, the agrarian schedule really meant that the parliament was convened during those times of the year when farmers, uh, you know, the rich landowners in particular, uh, needed to tend the least to their farms when they could, you know, have it managed by other people. Um, and parliamentary sessions kind of expanded to fill the winter seasons, uh, now often standing from very early morning to late in the evening, um, you know, or possibly all night if you, you know, it's, it's kind of funny, and it's also you know very male oriented. It's uh, it's very male dominated even in most countries. Rwanda is an interesting phenomena going on, um, but you know the schedules were very uh, were originally built around traditionally male roles in in Western countries, uh, and um, you know throughout that they they've kind of you know even with the emancipation of women. It's, it's been, you know, it's facilitated female presence in the parliament, but only to a very small degree. Uh, just, you know, despite things are getting better, but, uh, you know, the male-dominated parliament, they, they, you know, didn't really allow for, uh, or make allowances for kind of the inequality in, of social obligations, or, you know, and we, if we look at this, the, the history of 
of strong women leaders in Parliament, you know, like uh, Elizabeth uh, Domitian, uh, or you know, even Margaret Thatcher, though many people dislike her, uh, you know, or Han Myung Soo uh, Sung from uh, South Korea, you know. It's really impressive because not only did they, you know, fight through male-dominated environments to uh, to get into their positions, but you know, it wasn't just the scheduling they had to overcome. It was also the fact that the entire parliamentary process is very aggressive, elitist, and exclusionary. So, so some people, you know, and okay, so we could go on about all of the flaws of representation, you know, ad nauseum. Uh, but then somebody might say, you know, okay, so we don't want to have representatives of representatives representing each other and not us. You know, instead we could um, look to direct democracy. But the problem with direct democracy, where you know you have everybody voting directly for whatever they want, is that um, it is also exclusionary uh, because you know it demands that everybody be an expert in everything and that they have infinite time to mull over all the details. And, you know, this isn't particularly attractive either because, you know, uh, this leads to what I call dictatorships, uh, uh, dictatorship of free cycles. Uh, so, dictatorship of free cycles is, is kind of when um, certain people in the society uh, are so burdened with problems that they have to micromanage their, their, their solution to their problems on an everyday basis. But you know, and, and they don't really have any spare capacity to to make uh, you know to focus on more general societal uh, problems, uh, you know, uh, you know, while other people uh, have such a paucity of problems, you know, uh, of their own, they they don't have any problems, right? Uh, so they have a lot of free time, you know, what I call free cycles. To, to kind of sit around thinking about solutions to all sorts of problems that they perceive. Uh, but not, you know, they're often isolated from these problems themselves and don't necessarily understand what is an appropriate solution to them. So, you know, leading them to hypothesize about them uh, without critical feedback or, or, you know, and often arrive at very absurd ideas or solutions. So, the, this isn't very good, and it also, you know, has this kind of tendency towards minority rule and spoiler effects and whatnot. So, you know, just to just to illustrate this. So, imagine we have um, four candidates in an election, and the people who are voting they kind of vote like this. But, but in this election, there are two seats uh, up for offer. So, we we cast the votes, and obviously, uh, these two guys win. They they get the seats because they have the most votes. But see what just happened. All of these people didn't get anything, you know. So in effect, it's as if everybody, including the other two candidates, had had voted for for these two guys in equal measure, you know, roughly equal measure, uh, at the end of the day. And and that basically means that uh, that most people just don't get any um, uh, any access to to the kind of democracy we we're interested in talking about. But so. Democracies haven't uh, really eradicated oligarchy. You know, they've they've driven it into secrecy. They've caused people to to have to uh, do all sorts of things that we now call corruption. Uh, you know, in, instead of really uh, confronting the problems with the oligarchy, you know, it, democracy tends to just deny that it exists, and while while really practicing it openly, we see that you know all over the place. So. But at the same time, you know, wherever I go, I talk to people about this, and, and people have very romantic notions about democracy. It's, it's really amazing how, how people kind of glorify it as a concept. Uh, but it's become a very muddled term. When people say democracy, it really, you know, you're, you're hard pressed to find two people who can have a conversation about democracy and be talking about the same thing. And, and you know, we, we don't even agree what the subject is. So, you know, it's overloaded, it's, it's kind of become somewhat meaningless. And the meaning of the word has morphed over the ages from its original purpose of, uh, of you know, empowering certain elites to, to this kind of larger notion of, of being a system of governance where, where everybody is enfranchised. But, you know, the process is not really helping everybody. It's only helping very, very few people. And defining the intent of democracy is a very delicate question. So, you know, what, 
was democracy meant to do? What is it meant to be? Who is it supposed to help? You know, um, and and you know, we have to notice that universal franchise, you know, that everybody gets a vote and everybody gets a say, is historically a very different process from uh, from what we call democracy, right? So we have to make sure that whatever we replace it with doesn't just re replace one set of elites with another set of elites. So um, I asked on Twitter some months ago, hey, what's democracy for? And just like, you know, and I got, you know, several hundred responses. And you can see, you know, I'll just read a couple out for you. Um, you know, it's to ensure the relative absence of civil wars. Right, that's a very cynical view. Actually, a lot of them were incredibly cynical. Um, you know, d democracy is meant to provide legitimacy to policy in order to prevent the violent revolutions by giving everybody a say. Uh, someone says, um, you know, the most important for my money is the state of development where essential rights can never be unvoted. Um, democracy turns running a country into a giant popularity contest. One says, you know, and uh, I have I have hundreds of these here. Most of them are actually kind of um, surprisingly insightful and or very funny. Um, but you know, so me being a technologist, you know, what 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 does my kind of approach look like? Well, so technology is really useful, right? We're we're kind of here in in a bastion of technology of sorts, um, you know, CIS, but you know. A lot of them have problems. You know, I mean, we have great technologies. Concrete is a really great technology, and it very, very rarely fails. Um, you know, smartphones, laptops—they do tend to crash. They're not very good. And you know, whatever it is, even if you're very cynical about technology, it's hard to to deny that the world has has certainly changed uh, as a result of the, the widespread use of cars and telephones and airplanes and such. Um, societies have adop adapted to this more hectic uh, schedule and more extroverted civil life. You know, people uh, are kind of forced to be more open and public. You know, everybody has a Facebook profile now, right? Um, and, and you have the possibility of instantaneously communicating with anybody. Uh, but, you know, it's it's pretty tough because there's this risk that you know when we you know because the speed of of everything is is going so fast somebody's going to say hey let's use voting computers and let's use technology to to speed up democracy and make it faster and, and better but you know there is this risk that that moving to a more heavily computerized model of democracy will lead to severe problems uh, relating to transparency and confidence in the system, right? Um, there was a wonderful video that uh, uh, Rob Kongreip and some uh, people whose names I unfortunately don't know uh, did um, on the Indian voting system, the electronic voting system that's uh, used at least in some states here uh, a couple of years ago, where they just demonstrated three really easy ways to rig and you know, falsify election results. It was really easy, you know, if you're a moderately skilled technologist, uh, admittedly. But, you know, and all these problems can be solved, I think. Uh, but there needs to be a very high level of confidence in society, uh, in them, you know, if, we're, if we want people to believe that they work. Because more than anything else, democracy is this kind of shared illusion. We, we kind of all agree, you know, yeah, yeah, we're just going to believe in this thing. And if that illusion is dispelled because the technology is crap, then, then democracy won't work anymore. So, you know, there are technical challenges, but they might be tractable. I, I think they're intractable. But uh, specifically, you know, we need to find some way to ensure transparency of the elections and so on, and protection against fraud. And we need to ensure that any system that's used is ind independently auditable by anybody you know, who, uh, who takes a look at it. And, uh, and that anybody who wants can verify uh, that it's valid. And there shouldn't be any room for abuse. But you know, generally, when we talk about uh, election systems, we want them to be both verifiable and anonymous. 
actually, anonymous isn't exactly the, the right word. Um, so, you know, here, here's a bunch of, of features that uh, different theoreticians and you know, both political theorists but also economists and others have, have mentioned. And when, when we say we want it to be verifiable, we, we want to, you know, what we mean is when you cast a ballot, when you, when you cast a vote, um, it should be possible to verify that the vote was actually counted and not thrown away or counted twice or anything like that at the end of the row. So any, any person should be able to come in, take a look at the system and verify that it's doing the right thing. When we say uh, anonymous, we don't actually mean anonymous because we want to know that the right people are voting. You know, the people who are living in the country have the, the right credentials. But we don't want, under any circumstances, the, the vote itself to be linked back. So we call that unlinkability, right? Uh, that uh, unlinkability is a property of not being able to link a piece of information to the person who originated it. Then you have these other things. Some of them are quite technical, like uh, the term independence or relevant alternatives. It's, it's one of the most beautifully complicated concepts I've ever come across. And it just hurts my brain every time I think of it, um, you know. But, um, and you know, people might agree or disagree with, with these, but, but so I, I started thinking about this stuff uh, a long time ago, back in 2008, roughly. And, you know, basically uh, got into this mode of, of thinking, you know, is there an abstract data structure that can represent uh, and model systems of power? Uh, so, you know, how can we assume a hierarchical society you know, uh, in this centralized vision, and how can we redraw the map? And, you know, of course, you know, being a technologist, you know, uh, first idea was, hey, let's make a website, because that's kind of what people do nowadays when they have ideas. Uh, and and actually, uh, there were a couple of, uh, I just wrote a blog post and some other guys ran off, uh, I'll tell you about them a little bit later. Uh, they, they ran off and built this really cool website um, you know, that was called the Shadow Parliament. And the idea was that you know, we'd basically copy every issue that comes into the Icelandic Parliament and put it up on this website and then allow everybody to sign in and vote for or against it or to debate it or to propose amendments or do any of those things. And the idea was really simple. You know, we can say, okay, either, you know, everybody comes in there and does this thing, and, and either the actually elected politicians will start to follow the, what the public are saying, in which case they've shown themselves to be redundant and unnecessary, right? So we don't need the politicians anymore. Or they decide to ignore what the public is saying. In which case they've proven themselves to be un undemocratic. You know, pretty good, uh, you know, like only two options really. But there is a slight problem. Scale, um, critical mass. You know, it turns out, you know, this website had got about a thousand people using it. And that's great, we got a thousand people having opinions on laws. Uh, but, you know, we were several tens of thousands of people short of, of actually having the influence that we wanted. So, it didn't quite work. But in this, the, one of the core ideas was, you know, when you participate in a normal election, you, you know, and, or as a parliamentarian, to say, you basically get two options. You, you select a, you know, you participate, you select one of the options, so yes or no, or whatever it is, um, or you abstain, you, you blank vote, or you just don't show up. And we thought, well, uh, the thought was, how about we add the third option? We, we add a proxy, right? We say, uh, I, I'm not going to vote against, about this directly, but I'm going to trust you. you know, and, and of course, it's really important to be able to change your mind. Uh, that's something that general democracy doesn't have. You know, it, I don't think there's anything more human than being able to change your mind, but you know, you put the ballot in the ballot box and then you have to wait four years before you get to change your mind. That's not very human. But if we do this, then you could do vote proxying either generally or categorically or per issue, right? So you could say, you know, generally, uh, I'm apolitical, but I, I trust you. I, I believe that, that, you know, 
uh, you're a sensible person here, vote on my behalf, please. Or you can say, you know, I'm really interested in technology, I'm very interested in communications and transportation, public, you know, urban planning, but I really don't know anything about agriculture. You know, I, I'd love to know more, but, you know, don't, don't know anything, don't have the time, but I, I know this guy and he's a farmer and he knows exactly what he's doing and I trust him. Or you could say, well, so I'm, I'm monitoring all of the telecommunication stuff, but there is this bill that came in and I'm really busy this week and I can't really read through it and can't build a, a sensible, enlightened decision. So I say, well, you know, I know that you also work on these, these kind of issues, I trust you. Pretty simple, eh? So what, what you get is kind of, um, you know, person trusts a person, or person proxies to a person. And then, of course, you can have this second thing where, you know, this person decides to proxy to another person. And in which case, presumably, this person would have three votes. So <coughs> one, his own original vote, two, and then three. <coughs> because it, it's transitive, right? And you can get all sorts of weird things, but let's look at a very extreme example. Uh, so first off, direct democracy is the most extreme example on one side, because that's where everybody chooses to not proxy, right? They vote directly. But on the other extreme, we have this. Everybody proxies to one person. And that's what we call a dictatorship, right? And of course, in reality, most people would never do this, but this is a, a fairly accurate illustration of what happens when one guy gets all of the votes or has all of the power, right? And then, of course, we can come back to you know, uh, representative democracy and we see that it's actually just a highly advanced form of dictatorship, right? <laughs> so, how about this? So here we have a bunch of people. They're kind of scattered all over the place. And some of them are, are voting directly. Other people are trusting people. But there is a slight problem here. Do you see the problem? So let's hear. Here we have five people who are voting in a circle. And so we need to say, well, you, we can't allow that to happen. So we, we have this thing which mathematicians call a directed acyclic graph. Right, we say there must not be any cycles. Um, if we were to build this as a software system, we could actually enforce this in the software, either by you know, not allowing somebody to create the link or create the proxy where, uh, where it goes into a circle, or to just alert everybody when such a, a cycle has been built so that somebody can break it, and until that point in time, all of the votes are basically useless. Uh, there's lots of ways of, of doing this and thinking about this, but who's really making the decisions here? Well, you know, obviously it's the people who are deciding to vote. And you know, some of them are voting for themselves, others are voting um, with a lot of influence. Like, you know, in this, you know, all of these votes are running over to this guy who gets 13 votes. You know, while this person has 12, and these people have one, you know? And may, presumably, you know, this guy and, and that, uh, that person you know, they, they probably have some merit because a lot of people trust them. But if they, at any point, show that they have lost their merit, if, they, if they're caught lying or, or you know, stealing or you know, uh, engaging in, in corrupt activities, then people can just stop trusting them. That's really easy. You just, you know, take, their, take your vote back and they don't get to have a say on your behalf anymore. And so this is kind of the idea that, that was called uh, liquid democracy. That was not a name I came up with. Um, so what happened was I started talking about this and you know, ranting at people back in 2008. And, and lots of people ran off in various directions uh, and started building cool software. And I was like, wow, cool software everywhere. You know, it's, it's great. And one of the most uh, successful systems to date is called Liquid Feedback. And the guys who made that, uh, uh, they, they called the entire thing Liquid Democracy. And I really like that term. It's a, it's a pretty cool term because it emphasizes how liquid things can be. But it also makes a nice reference to this economic concept of liquidity, where, you know, as we said, and as I said earlier, you know, you, if you only get one vote per four years, you don't have any liquidity. And if you think of it as money, you know, the person who has, you know, 
billions of dollars in bonds and stocks, but has no cash in his pockets. He can't go get an ice cream. But the, the guy who has you know a couple of rupees in his pocket might be able to go and buy a, uh, 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 an ice cream or whatever it is he wants. And that, that's kind of liquidity really matters because it allows us to, to make more smaller decisions. And when we're talking about money, we're talking about liquidity in, in a personal, individual sense of, I intend this for me. But when we talk about votes, we're talking about liquidity in a social sense of, I intend this for society. And I think that's a very cool idea. So we've done a bunch of experiments. And you know, thankfully, I, I didn't um, really touch a lot of these. but. Uh, a lot of them are kind of important. So, oddly, this is happening again now. So this is uh, the main square in, in Reykjavik, Iceland. Uh, so in, in 2007, Iceland was a pretty rich country. It was doing really well. Uh, and then there was this banking collapse. And, uh, and pretty much overnight, um, you know, about 17 18 of the economy disappeared. Um, you know, in, in terms of, of the value of the banks. So, 2000, uh, well, that, that happened in 2008. And uh, these protests started and eventually the, um, the government <coughs> fell and there was this, you know, big kind of, uh, some people called the revolution. I wouldn't call it the revolution because nothing actually changed except for the names of the people who were running the country. But they did shift the policy somewhat. And, you know, the economy failed. Uh, this was kind of one of the, the slogans. I'm not going to translate it in polite company. <laughs> but, um, but a lot of people started to come together and say, OK, can we build better tools? Can we, can we construct uh, better ideas for, for how to govern a country like this? And, you know, at this point, this idea was already out there. And, and we said, well, we have this internet thing. And we've learned a lot of really cool lessons from the internet. You know, many of them were, were kind of obvious in a, in a certain sense, but you know, the internet has, has changed the way we do mass media. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we've now got um, YouTube and podcasts and blogs and whatnot. And, and it's also changed the way we do production in, in certain ways with free software and Creative Commons licensing and free hardware and free culture material. Um, and you know, it's also changed the way we do knowledge with Wikipedia and, and other things like that. Uh, but, you know, could we change democracy? So the shadow parliament really may, it was a starting point for this. Uh, and this was the original uh, thing that uh, uh, Robert Bjarnason wrote uh, working with Gunnar Bjornsson. Um, and they basically, you know, listed all the things people could go in. It was it was a very cool experiment, but it got very little traction. About the same time in Germany, uh, the pirate parties were getting uh, getting started there, and, and these guys I mentioned who who built uh, liquid feedback um, built this liquid democracy system that that they used uh, for internal organization within the German pirate party. And since then, other pirate parties around uh, Europe have, have adopted similar approaches. Um, and so Robert and Gunnar, these guys who built the first version of the Shadow Parliament, they, they went and founded the Citizens Foundation as a tr uh, an attempt to try and kind of build a, a, an umbrella of some kind for this kind of experiments. And, and they did, um, did a lot of very interesting work. We always had this weird disagreement. Uh, you know, uh, they're old friends of mine. You know, I love working with them. But we always had this disagreement where I kept saying, you know, it, we need to focus on on how pure and functional the system is, and they kept saying, no, 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 no. We just need to make sure everybody wants to participate. And you know, we still disagree on this a bit because uh, you know there there are problems in both directions. But they've been doing amazing work. One of the things they did was uh, the system called Beta Reykjavik. And in a sense, you can see how this is kind of a, a natural a development from the Shadow Parliament. But what happened was Reykjavik, the, the capital city, after the last municipal elections, um, 
the best party that got into power uh, with this comedian guy as as a frontrunner, and you know, um, who who uh, loudly proclaimed that um, that he would not go into any kind of coalition uh, in the city with uh, with a party whose whose uh, representatives had not watched the wire. Right. Uh, you know, lots of really fun stuff there. Uh, you know, there's there's some interesting uh, political theory in the wire that I think he was referencing. But um, one of the things they did was the day after the election, they opened this website and said, "We're going to take the five best ideas off this website every month and implement them." Just very simple statement. But you know, uh, there's there's some amazing things that came out of it. Uh, one of the first ideas that went through was there was this nine-year-old girl who posted this idea that, uh, and this is all municipal stuff, so it's, uh, it's not quite you know, countryside stuff, but one of the things that's built with the municipal level in Iceland is uh, the elementary schools. And this nine-year-old girl posted, I would like it if we had more field trips in school. And people read it and, yeah, support, you know, and uh, voted it up. And, um, at the end of the month, it went through and became official city policy to try and promote more field trips. Very simple thing. And most of the things were very simple that people were putting in. Uh, so, you know, uh, this one here, which is marked in progress, and actually, uh, interestingly, just today, um, the, uh, there was a news item saying that this project is finished. It says, um, like, li lighten up Kleriviskata, which is a street in, in Reykjavik, that's kind of been a bit shambolic and, and you know, torn down for, for many years. Now it's just been renovated and made a lot nicer. You know, and it, most of the ideas were very simple things. You know, clean up this thing, uh, fix this park, uh, change the speed limit of this road. You know, all, pretty much obvious things. So. Then, of course, following that success, they went on and built Better Eastland, which is, you know, uh, is kind of the, the countrywide example of this, where they said, hey, we're going to you know, try to do the same thing on a country level. Now, this one didn't take off quite as much. And do you know why? It's because the government didn't show any interest in it. They didn't say, oh, we're going to take the five best ideas here and, and implement them. You know? Uh, if they had, then people would uh, would maybe be incentivized to participate, and that's really one of the major things that we see in all of these kind of participatory collaborative systems. Is if you don't have a, a real ability to to influence the policy, then you're not going to participate. And we see this in in countries. You know, lots of countries have very low voter turnout, and normally, if you talk to people from those countries. It, it's kind of like, yeah, I could go vote, but it's not actually going to change anything, right? And once people have that mindset, you know, and, and often it's because there's some systemic thing that's causing it, then, you know, obviously people aren't going to bother participating when they could be doing other things which are more meaningful, right? So, you know, just adding that little feature of actually taking people seriously and actually doing what people want completely changes the dynamics of how how these participatory systems work. And that kind of leads to this weird general theory that in order for democracy to work, you need two things. People need to have access to information in order to be able to make enlightened decisions, and people need to have the ability to actually make those decisions. It's pretty simple, if you think about it. But it seems to actually be the case. So uh, just. You know, one of the things they set up was your priorities, which is basically the same system, but for every country in the world. So every country in the world has has an instance on this, and you can just go in and um, you know onto this website, and you get the India version, and la la la. la. Um, so, of course, you know, we disagreed about a bunch of stuff. And when I was uh, I was in Morocco a couple of years ago, two years ago, and working with a bunch of activists there and, and you know the king of Morocco is kind of a uh, dictatorial you know and uh, pretty bad guy uh, I was about to say rude words um, but you know so I was sitting down with these activists and, and they were like oh we want to build, uh, set up a liquid democracy system can we set up liquid feedback and I'm like sure let's set it up and you know, create an instance for you so we did that 
except it was really, really hard. And then when we finally got it to run, you know, it's like nobody could understand how it worked. It, it was just such a bad user experience. And so we thought, okay, let's try your priorities and, uh, and tried that, but it wasn't quite what they wanted. It, you know, there was no ability to make kind of uh, groups that were self-determining and things like that. So, you know, I said, okay, you know, let's try all the other systems. And we tried a bunch of them. And all of them had some problem. Most of them just weren't very usable, were very hard to use. So I said, well, none of them has actually implemented liquid democracy the way I thought about it originally anyway. So why don't we just build a new system? And we called it Wasail, which is an Arabic word for uh, means. Uh, I don't have a screenshot for some idiotic reason, sorry. But um, it, it means means. But if you uh, drop this last bit, then it means liquid. It's very interesting how you get uh, liquid and then add a little thing and it becomes capability or the ability to do something. So I like that. So we've been working on that quite a bit. It's used in the Icelandic Pirate Party um, and it's got some good features, but ironically, it's pretty hard to use. So you know, we, we all screw up sometime, right? But alongside all of this thread, there was this other thing going on, which was in Iceland in, in 2008, after the collapse, there was this big call for a new constitution. And people said, well, we need to build a new constitution, a better one, one that actually represents you know, our country. Because the, the old constitution is from 1944, and it was actually just the, the previous constitution from 1918, which had been written by Danish officials. But the word king had been stricken out when we got independence, and they put the word president instead. That was pretty much the only change. There were a couple of things. Uh, I think there were six changes in total, but they were very mi minute. So in 2009, um, there was, um, was this big national meeting. There were lots of people. That's, oh, I never noticed. I, I know that guy. <laughs> um, but, um, but, you know, it's... Uh, this big meeting saying, okay, what do we actually want for the country? And then it was repeated in 2010, you know, again. So uh, in these national meetings, uh, the, the second one, 1,000 people were picked at random from the census and put into a big room together for a day and then worked through several iterations of, you know, writing down ideas on cards and, uh, you know, debating them and then writing, you know, more elaborate ideas and kind of fleshing it all out. Um, and uh, this is a word cloud of the ideas from, from the 2010 meeting. Uh, now, remember, you know, Iceland's a very, very, very small country. Uh, so when 1,000 people uh, show up in the same place, it's actually 0.5% of the population. So, you know, very different uh, statistics. But there's still this interesting thing that uh, you can always subdivide societies until you get to the level of one person. Uh, and then you should really stop subdividing because people don't like that. Uh, but um, but this led to this constitutional process where uh, 25 people were uh, elected, um, you know, to sit down and actually write the the constitution itself. And uh, they did an amazing job. They wrote. Uh, I've read dozens of constitutions because I'm a bit of a crazy nerd. But, um, but this, this one that they wrote was by, you know, it was amazing, it was really good. And one of the things that they did was every week they published a new version, like just what they had up until that date. And they said, hey, send us comments, send us observations. So they were soliciting advice through, through like a form on their website and through email and through Facebook and Twitter and, you know, whatever. And it was, it was pretty good. Uh, around that same time, we set up this, uh, me and Elnor Saita set up um, the constitutional analysis support team where one of the things we were doing was saying, okay, can we take the principles of information security, you know, threat modeling and things like that, and apply them to legal documents? It turns out you can. Uh, a lot of it comes down to linguistic uh, stuff. And this is actually um, an incorrect, um, parse tree, but uh, you know, it's, uh, it was a very interesting experiment. And one of the things that we discovered doing this 
was we found a, a flaw in the way that the Constitutional Council uh, had decided to set up the Supreme Court uh, that could lead to the Parliament actually putting, uh, kind of taking over the Supreme Court in certain situations. So we just said, hey guys, here's a suggestion, fix this bug. And uh, that was taken into consideration and fixed. So, you know, there's a lot of different ideas, right? It's, uh, it's a big mismatch and I didn't go into any of the you know, crazy algorithms and you know, uh, and you know, we uh, do have a draft solution to how you guarantee both verifiability and unlinkability in in this kind of direct uh, liquid democracy system. But it's very uh, heavily mathematical and kind of uh, it takes a while to explain. But you know, but I think this kind of serves as a bit of a core because you know, going back to our our kind of story, you know, from the beginning. And we can say, you know, it's early on election day and, and the sun shining and mostly cloud the sky. But voters don't necessarily rush to the polls because, you know, they, they turn up when they want. They, they don't really care because every day is election day. And, you know, they log into their intent systems, their liquid democracy systems, whenever they feel like it. And, and they look at which items are trending. And they you know, might uh, see some proposals that, that they think are daft and they just say, no, 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 these are bad. And then others say, upvote and say, this is a good idea. And, you know, some idiots somewhere are, are debating, uh, you know, with each other about some healthcare issue. And, you know, it's the internet after all. You know, people are always going to be trolls there. But, you know, ah, look, you know, somebody invoked Godwin's Law, you know, um, called somebody a Nazi there. And you know, you decide. Okay, whatever. You know, I'm just going to delegate this to to my friend. You know, or I'm I'm going to delegate it to my friend because he's a doctor. He's, you know, he cares about this stuff. He knows a lot about it, and uh, you know, he'll figure it out. And and then I notice that my friend's already you know uh, delegated it onwards to to this other guy. Um, you know, it's a it's a transient chain, and it goes on and on and on. And suddenly the the vote that that I just delegated onwards ends up with some guy in Singapore who is a you know specialist in this particular field. And I go, okay, you know, I've never heard of this guy, but you know, trust is a form of intent as well. And this is a society where uh, where it's not governed by kings or presidents or parliaments, uh, but by social choice, by by what each and every one of us decides on a daily basis, right? And the will of the people should be done. On every scale, you know, individuals use money, but groups use votes, and we we can practically collapse these two things into one idea. I intend, right? You know, poverty in this kind of mythical world would probably be you know uh, used to be a major problem, uh, and this is in part because we define poverty as a lack of money. Now, you know. There's a lot more to poverty than, than not having money. Um, uh, Ian Banks, uh, who is a science fiction author, he, he famously said that money is a sign of poverty. Now, when you have money in a system, it's, it's, it's a, sing a signal that somebody doesn't have it. And similarly, I think you know, money is a, uh, is a sign, oh, well, no, poverty is a sign of money as well, right? Um, but in a world where, where everything is governed by intent, where everybody has as many votes as they need, one per issue, of course, but you know, can create as many issues as they want, to talk about any ideas they want, then you know, when we have these ideas for mediating intent, pushing it onwards through a chain and coming to collective decisions, then you know, there is a certain type of poverty that at least is alleviated, even if the economic one still takes a while. So, Personal choices abound, you know, but unlike the other me method, your hopes and dreams aren't missing. The thing to remember, though, is that societies are messy. At the end of the day, you know, there's all sorts of complexity that gets in entered into them. People argue about all sorts of things. Everybody has differing opinions, and and you know, when we kind of agree to accept the idea of representative democracy, one of the things we're doing is saying. I am not going to participate in, in trying to deal with this mess. I'm going to just hope that, that the person who deals with it 
somehow magically, even if it's by accident, decides to, to represent some of my ideas, maybe. But that's not a good way of running a society. So I call this the future of democracy, but you know, I can't tell you what the future is. I try to tell you one idea for how we might try to do it a little bit differently. And you know, maybe it's the right idea, maybe it's the wrong idea. Time will tell. But the thing, you know, what I really want to leave you with is just, you know, let's go and experiment, let's figure out new ways of organizing things because you know, the thing we've got isn't really doing very well and surely we can do better. Thanks. Uh, at this point, we should have uh, brief uh, statements from our co-organizers. Do you want to just uh, say hello to everybody? <laughs> Introduce uh, Tactical Technology Collective and uh, has uh, has the Ma Maya, you first? Sure. Just, say, just say hello. Hi, uh, my name is Maya. I um, work at Tactical Tech. And um, we support activists and ad advocates to use technology in their um, advocacy. It's a global non-profit based in uh, Berlin with uh, all sorts of sleeper cells and al qaeda type <laughs> extensions in uh, across the planet. So that's tactical tech. Has has geek. Okay, I'm uh, Kiran from has geek, and um, we are a very local group. Uh, we have no branches anywhere except in Bangalore. Um, what we do is get people in technology to talk to each other about what they do. Uh, primarily as a way to learn from each other. So thanks to uh, Tactical Technology Collective and Hasgate for co-organizing this event with us. If we had done this event uh, completely by ourselves, there would be only one or two people in the audience. Uh, all of you are here thanks to the outreach that both these organizations are able to pull off. Uh, so uh, thanks to Smani for that compelling talk. Uh, we can open up for questions, maybe. Yeah, 15 minutes? Sure. Perhaps. And even after that, we can just have conversations amongst ourselves. I'm in no hurry to go anywhere. Yeah, so we can do it <laughs> formally for about 15, 20 minutes and then take it uh, informally for as long as it lasts. We have yeah. a lawn here, and as long as you have beer, I'm assuming beer. the conversation will beer. continue. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. Shall we take a round of questions first, or just one at a time? One at a time, because uh, I've noticed this is a thing uh, that happens a lot, is uh, when if somebody accepts three questions, they'll normally only answer one of them, and they'll normally pick the most convenient one. <laughs> so, no shortcuts. Okay, one question at a time. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, Vijay. It's very good to know that you know, people as a pioneer who are participating in democracy. But, you know, in the given country like India, where the technology might be so prominent, do you think this kind of technology, do you think this kind of experiment should be able to work on? If at all, we have to make it work, what are the steps that can be taken considering the technology? Yeah. Uh, this is one of the reasons I was interested in doing this here, because India is is very interesting and it's really a special place, because uh, I don't think any country is really uh, you know uh, on as fast a trajectory as India, and you know that's going to present very interesting problems, very interesting solutions as well. But the answer is right now the technology divide is too big to for it to work on a national level. It's never going to work on a national level until uh, literacy improves, access to technology improves, access to telecommunications improves. Um, and you need it to be pretty close to 100%. You can take certain shortcuts. Uh, shortcuts include putting up uh, public um, you know, voting stations where basically computers that people can come to and use. Uh, there are problems with that, mostly information security problems. There's you know, all sorts of tricks, but you know, it's going to be a long way. What you can do now is there are lots of communities in India that can do that right now. Uh, normally, you know, slightly more affluent ones where there is a lot of access to technology. You know, cell phones can be the, the voting system, right? You, you know, and in communities where you have very high cell phone penetration, you can actually do this right now. And maybe that's the starting point to bootstrap small municipalities, small towns, small neighborhoods, and then work your way up and, and get it on a larger scale. But currently, you know, no country in the world has used this for its own organization. 
And frankly, I'm not sure the technology is ready for it. So, you know, using it on a small scale for now might be a good idea. You know, we should experiment. Is that good? I should answer more briefly. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. The, the second question from the gentleman at the back. If, if you could uh, introduce yourself briefly before you ask your question. And Identity systems. Yeah, yes. Yeah. And th is this the same as the ID card? Yes. 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 This, is, this is the biometric uh, yeah. identity management yeah. system. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I know uh, you've been a uh, soon has been a pretty harsh critic of that system, and um, and it looked pretty terrible when you were t telling me about it in Portugal uh, those years ago. But I don't know if it's improved. But probably not. <laughs> no. Uh, the, the, qu the question is, if we can rig up the nation yeah. for biometric identification, yeah. can we ride on the same infrastructure to do uh, yeah. de to do democracy? Yeah. democracy process? I think that's the question. Right? So the answer is partially. Um, it is a very different scenario because you need more uh, more technology, but. You might be able to do it with things like, uh, you know, more cell phones and things like that. On the other hand, the identity card scheme is very interesting in this sense because even though the scheme as it was implemented here is pretty terrible from what I've heard, uh, identity management is actually one of the things you need to have working if you're going to have a functioning uh, voting system. If you don't have some kind of a way of telling who is supposed to vote and who isn't, then you can't, uh, you know, can't actually do the thing right. So you can write on part of that. You know, you can use the fact that the identity scheme now exists to facilitate voter lists and whatnot, but you're going to need a lot more infrastructure as well. And on the other hand, the fact that they could do that scheme is proof that you can probably do the other thing too. Right? Uh, can I go with an outsider's question first? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's my sister, by the way. Oh, no. <laughs> Um, oh no. My question was about, I, I don't know if I understood it correctly, but okay. the proxy voting. Yes. So I give my vote to you, yeah. and, and, and I think, okay, I'm going to give you the vote because you know a lot about technology, mm -hmm. and then, and he knows Julian Assange, so okay. he's going to vote, you know, in that line, I like Julian Assange. Okay. What if I can't account that for you changing your mind? or you and I actually having differences in very small, minute ways, right. and then you turn around and say, actually, I don't like Julian Assange anymore, he's not my friend anymore, and you split from what I thought yeah. your trajectory was, yeah. then how do you account for you changing your mind and you being bought or yeah. influenced? Right, well, okay, so that's a very good question. I was going to address it, you know, things like that, but, so there's a couple of ways of doing this. One is, um, one is the kind of most close to the way we think about things now, which is, um, you know, the issue comes up and you vote on it. Uh, and then there's a certain deadline, you know, at which point you can't vote on it anymore, and if it passed, it passed. If it didn't pass, it didn't pass, right? And you, using that, then the problem you're talking about might actually be a real problem. Uh, but if we say, okay, let's just skip this deadline thing. Let's just say, you know, when somebody creates an issue, it exists forever. If the issue gets enough support, like over 50% of the population or something, then it becomes law. If the support changes, then it stops being law. Uh, and, you know, get, it gets lower, right? Uh, and you might put in some kind of rule to stop it from oscillating if it, in and out of law if it's you know, close. So you might put, like, there has to be a 10 or 15% change you know, something like that. Um, and what you get from that is 
even if somebody you know uh, betrayed you, your trust or something like that, or you miss uh, mis uh, kind of misapprehended what they stood for, uh, then you can always take your vote back and change it after the fact. And you know nothing is forever, and you you retain the ability to change your mind past this deadline. So I think that might be an interesting thing, but that's a much bigger rethinking of how we do legal structures and things like that, and it's a harder sell. The other thing that's important there is, so in the same way as one person gets one vote on each issue, it is very important that dead people don't get to vote. So in, in Iceland now, the oldest law that's still in effect is from the year 1263, I think. And as far as I know, nobody who is alive in Iceland ever voted on that law. Like, if there is, then that person's really old. But, like, I don't think anybody, you know, uh, like, most people have never even read that law. And I've read it. It's not that bad. But I would really like it if, if I actually got to vote on it. And that brings up this interesting idea of saying, okay, when you come of age, when, you, when you're you know, a child, you get education in school, and you start to learn about all of the laws which are in effect, and then you know, at the coming of age, you know, when you turn 18 or whatever it is, some, some arbitrary thing that we decide, then you vote for each law. Like, and you say, yes, I support this one, no, I don't support that one. And similarly, when you die, your vote stops counting. And that way, simply people dying can cause laws to fall out of effect. And if the youth of the country come up and say that was a stupid idea, then they can change it. And, you know, and that way, the law stops being this kind of historical artifact and starts being something that lives with people who are actually living under the law. So you know, there's lots of weird ideas that you can play with like that. There's no one solution that's necessarily right. but. We can do things to to make that stuff work. Uh, Maya, you can take Maya's question then come check. Well, also thanks, but also because um, it's kind of freaky that mine was sort of like hers, and <laughs> also no surprise that we're both more on the social science side of things than yeah. than the technology side. Um, I was interested in the idea of just human behavior, which yeah. is I think what that question is about. That um, you started off talking about this sort of Hobbesian idea. Um, yeah can't trust human beings and I'm interested in how does that become something in a threat model? At the end you talked about that and I really find that very yeah. fascinating that you would try to threat model things that can go wrong with it. So how do you quantify yeah. something like you know people behaving badly? Okay, uh, that's a very long conversation <laughs> but uh, let me try and so Really what you do is you try to look at the system, the laws or the rules as they've been put out, and you try and figure out how they can be, like, if you take the most evil person or group of people that you can think of, how would they abuse this to gain more power than they should, or, you know, something like that. And often it's just like thinking, okay, you know, this says this, and, uh, like, there might be some condition, you know, um, income tax is a really good example. So a lot of countries have this kind of, you know, you, you pay a certain income tax up to a certain point, and above that you get, you know, pay more income tax. So what people do is they start to uh, kind of adjust their wages so they're just below the tax bracket or something like that. And of course it varies from system to system whether this is actually useful. But people always try and find a way to manipulate systems in the benefit. And when you're building the system, whether it's a system of laws or, or software or whatever, you just have to try and anticipate it and, and, you know, and build in tests for, you know, will it be abused this way, will it be abused that way. And, you know, I, I completely disagree with Hobbes. I think we can trust people, we can trust each other. We need to be aware that there might be people who are trying to abuse the system. But we shouldn't not build the system in an open and participative way just because there might be some spoils for us. You know, the bad apples thing. You know, we shouldn't have to worry about bad apples. We should just build against them. You know? I think that's the short form. But we can go into linguistic parsing and uh, parse trees and, uh, you know, uh, unbound variable checking and stuff like that if you want later. I'll let the gentleman in front go first and then you, sir. 
uh, the question is not about democracy or something. So the, the question is about the bitcoins. Okay. Uh, bitcoins these days are getting very popular and getting a lot of buzz. So is it legal to use a bitcoin? And is it legal to accept bitcoin as a business? I don't know. And uh, yeah. in the global perspective yeah. and as well as in an Indian perspective. Okay. I don't know Indian law. Uh, I'm not a lawyer, let alone an Indian lawyer, I'm afraid. But I know that there are lots of countries where they are legal. Um, and there's a lot of you know, weird things like uh, some countries don't allow uh, personal currencies or, or you know, stuff that isn't state regulated. Uh, India has very strict laws regulating the inflow, inflow and outflow of currencies. So like, uh, I have a Bitcoin wallet on my phone. And I have, you know, very little in it, but but it is some amount. And there is a question, you know, did I accidentally violate Indian law by bringing my cell phone into the country? I hope not. I'd rather not violate your laws. But so globally speaking, it seems to be okay, and the majority of countries probably are going to be okay with it. China has banned it. Russia has banned it. Uh, it's illegal in Iceland, instantly. But that's. Uh, you know, law from 1944, that, no, 1940 even, that, that bans it. So I just don't know enough about Indian law, I'm afraid. Um, However, um, after uh, that, um, on, sorry, it's mostly legal in India. There yeah. are only a couple of things to watch out for. One, you still have to pay tax. Sorry? There are only a couple of things that you need to be concerned about if you use Bitcoin in India. One, you have to pay tax. Yeah. So you can't escape tax by dealing in Bitcoin. That's what the law says. You know, it's a matter of whether somebody can face you or not. But then you're testing your luck. It's not about the law. The yeah. second thing is you're still subject to the Foreign Exchange Regulation Act. So if you bought Bitcoin by spending rupees, it's not your problem. But if you bought Bitcoin by spending dollars, then just make sure you don't violate FERA laws by doing that. So, so um, interestingly, Bitcoin is the answer to the thing that I decided not to go into. So the, the question of how do you have anonymity and verifiability uh, Bitcoin is based on this concept called the blockchain, and the blockchain, you know, it can be used for more things than just Bitcoins. It, uh, it generally can be used for anything where you need a verified, a guaranteed, anonymous public ledger. So, what's that? You know, you can use that for for votes. Basically, you know, if we imagine there's a you know Bitcoin that we generate for the selection, and we give each person one Bitcoin. And then we allow them to spend it on whichever option they want. Right? That's basically, uh, you know, it, 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 there's a little bit of finessing there that needs to be done, especially around what's called zero information proofs. But, uh, but that's basically how we solve that problem of verifiability and unlinkability. So you know, I'm glad you brought it up. Well, we'll take the gentleman at the back and then we'll come to you. Can you speak up? The liquid democracy can take care of minority interests. Yeah. That's my question. And uh, since you had an analogy with, uh, in terms of liquidity in economics, yeah. uh, how do you get a central bank kind of a monster here to uh, uh, right. control liquidity? Yeah. And, uh, and regarding proxy voting, uh, do you think it can lead to a situation of more specialists? And, and people not thinking. Okay, uh, so those were three questions, so I'll try to remember all of them. Um, let, uh, let's do the minority one last because it's, it's very important and it's kind of complicated. So, uh, regarding the, the middle one, do we have a central bank? Well, when you do elections now, you have a central bank but it's called the Election Authority, or Election Commission, or something like that. If we move to the, uh, the kind of Bitcoin-inspired blockchain model, then you get rid of a lot of what the central bank, quote-unquote, does, but you still have to have this really important thing, which is the list of who gets to vote, a list of all of the participants in the polity, in the society, whether it's municipality or whatever. And somebody has to maintain that list, Unless you go for a completely open model and say, anybody who feels that they uh, have an interest can participate. That might be a bit dangerous. You know, there, there might be 
you know, threats associated with that. But probably what people are always going to go with is some kind of exclusionary model of saying only these people get to actually have votes, and hopefully that you know that will also include uh, you know all the minorities in society or be done in a fair way. We can't really guarantee that. So your third question had to do with sorry, give me a keyword. It was specialization and what the ODD specialization. Specialization, yes. The answer is possibly yes, but I think what you see in most societies is you already have a high level of specialization. Um, whether you will get this speciali specialist driven society where where basically instead of uh, you know elected politicians you get kind of this elitist dictatorship of the specialists quote unquote i think that depends very heavily on how much public debate there is so whether you have a strong independent media whether you have uh, large forums where people can participate and, and share their views if you have that then i think more you, you'll see more of a trend towards um, generalists and, and people who, who just think of uh, things for themselves. And actually, you know, I, I really believe that if you give everybody a vote on every issue, most people will uh, try to be informed about most things for themselves. I can't prove this. This is a, this is a hypothesis, but you know, I, I think that that would actually be the case. As for the minorities, Okay, people tend to always point at Switzerland and say, look, women didn't get to vote in Switzerland until the 1960s. You know, how, you know, direct democracy is obviously a failure. And, you know, partially it's true. Uh, partially, you know, the, the downside of allowing everybody to vote is that the idiots also get to vote. And there's not really much we can do about that. But if we... If we actually believe that democracy is a value, uh, valuable idea, then, then we're going to have to s somehow contract that by you know, figuring out other ways of, of making sure that minorities aren't just oppressed. And you know, in reality, I think that comes back to the same point, which is if you have a lively public debate and, and people are well educated and, and know enough about how the world works, to not succumb to to kind of extremist views and and you know idiotic you know uh, ideas about their supremacy over others and self righteousness and generally what we call the traits of, uh, of uh, right wing authoritarians, um, which is a term really well defined in a book by Bob Altemeyer called the Authoritarians. I really recommend reading it if you have the time or or wherewithal. But you know really the. Um, I don't think we should rely on angels in the Hobbesian sense to come and save the minorities. We should really believe in, in the ability of societies to be smart and, and to work together. You know. Sorry if I'm an idealist here. The gentleman in front? Yeah. Yeah. So in the proxy model, yeah. people who are carrying a lot of weight or influence, yeah. do you think that should be public knowledge? Yes. Uh, because then my question obviously is that they could become targets of having their minds changed by yeah. some things. Yeah, absolutely. And, or do you think that that, that that influence may get to change many people's because the decisions are on many uh, the proxy voting is on many short lived issues or it comes from issues. Yeah. So the answer is that would depend a lot on the little characteristics of the system, like we were talking about like um, you know whether whether issues become uh, valid you know, when uh, at a deadline or not, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, all the little minute details will change the, the dynamics of the system. That's just one of the, the, this is what we call a chaotic system. There's really no way to, to, to predict it. But I think it should be public knowledge uh, to a certain extent. I don't know how much. That's also something different societies will have to decide for themselves. Some might say if you have more than five votes, then it becomes public. Maybe you just say that when I forward my vote to somebody, I can see who I forwarded it to, but I can also see the rest of that chain. But that's actually equivalent to, uh, to the entire chain being public because, uh, because then I can just take a list of all the voters and build a little computer program that changes my proxy to each one in turn and then I just map it out, right? Um, which you know, is a kind of break. 
So the answer is it depends. You know, uh, some societies will be more open and um, you know uh, less worried about undue influence and uh, and violence and things like that. One of the reasons you add in that rule that dead people can't vote or dead people don't have a vote is literally to protect people. Because if I can force you to vote for something and then kill you so that you can't change your mind and your vote still is valid, then that kind of you know, can uh, break down into a pretty bad thing. However, if I come to you and say, I'll shoot you if you don't vote for this, then I need to go off and threaten somebody else. And while I'm doing that, you change your, your vote. And you know, I'm going to have to have a very large army if I'm going to swing the entire election. Right? So you know, there's interesting population dynamics and systemic dynamics that you know, we just need to try and play with and figure out. I think uh, one question from Hasgi. Are you Hasgi? And then one question from Sierra is perhaps. So we need to close. Huh? So my, may, uh, yes. So the thing is, you said you have been closely following the fan recent phenomenon of the Aadmi Party in India. Yeah. So I guess uh, you also know that, uh, that when they were at a particular stage after the election, <coughs> they went out right into the public through the uh, social network thinking media and asked the general public if they should ideally form a government or not. Yeah. It's like a phenomenal thing in India. Yeah. What is your uh, idea or say about uh, taking the whole thing of democracy on? Like it's something which we I have never seen in my whole life. Yeah. Right? But what are the merits and what are the demerits? How do you see it? Right. So uh, that's kind of what, what I've been talking about. But um, there are there are problems with it. Primarily, none of the systems we have today are good enough. And they still need to be developed. We have this idea of using the blockchain. It's a bit better than, you know, than the electronic voting systems that, that people are using. Um, you know, it's going to take a while. But even then, there's a technology gap that, that uh, the man at the back mentioned. That you know, currently, not everybody has access to cell phones or computers. Not everybody is even literate. So you know, we need to take all of those steps very carefully and. And you know, it, it, it's really a societal thing, not a technology thing. Um, about you know that idea of, of you know a party coming out and saying, hey, let, you know, we want your advice. Why isn't that the what always happens, right? I mean, you know, even though we don't have the technology yet, we still have the ability to change the way the politicians and the politics kind of work. And I actually, you know, I, I understand that uh, Amar Nea has uh, been having lots of trouble. And a lot of that trouble, I think, comes from the fact that they went from nothing to really powerful very quickly. And it takes time to build political infrastructure. Trust me, I know with the Icelandic Pirate Party, you know, a much smaller system, but we've had all sorts of problems because, you know, it just takes a long time to, to become comfortable with running that kind of thing. Um, but I actually see them as kind of a, an equivalent to the Pirate Party in that we, you know, these are all parties that are popping up all over the world now in, and saying we need more direct participation from the public. And they're coming because the, you know, uh, the, the kind of um, uh, representative democracy system isn't working the way it should. So, okay, so previously it used to be like uh, people vote for a person. Yeah. So now the entire scene has been changed to like uh, instead of voting for a person, they are voting for an idea. Yeah. So this is actually changing the whole system of democracy, right? Like instead of putting up people, they put on ideas and ask people to vote for ideas. Yeah. So we are bringing democracy to a new, a new level, right? Not so it's a change in democratic system. Itself. Yeah. It is. It is and it isn't because sure, we the general public have always been asked to uh, to vote for people. But then the people get into parliament, and those people vote for ideas. And we're not changing anything fundamentally. We're just saying that instead of having, you know, in Iceland, 63 people you know, who were elected to make all of the decisions, let's just grow that group until it's everybody. You know? I think that's a sensible idea. We'll take the last question from Anirudh, yeah, sure. and then uh, bring the formal part to yeah. those. So uh, you were talking about how this little girl that voted for more field trips and that got me thinking. Yeah. One of the most underrepresented majorities in the world are children. Yes. And it's sort of this uh, proxy voting system is voluntary in sense. But it tends to not be voluntary where, wherever proxy voting for children has been uh, in place. Like, mm -hmm. talk about Morocco, for example, where I think it was tried. The parents tend to do it. 
Yeah. Now, if the justification for proxy voting is uh, lack of pure democracy because of an asymmetry of information, yeah. then wouldn't it be like how, first of all, how do you do it? Like, how do children vote? Do the parents vote for them? And if that's the case, then wouldn't it be better to have like a children's rights or children's interest group that represents children instead of parents? Yeah. So I've <laughs> I have struggled with this one um, because. On the one hand, children are very uh, easily manipulated by their parents. Um, if you just say every human gets a vote, you know, regardless of age, then of course the parents are going to use that for whatever they want, and that gives people who have children a bit more power. Possibly that's okay. Possibly people who have children just, you know, have a certain right to have a bit more say in, in the way things work. And we have to, uh, I, I at least would like to live in a society where parents are actually, um, you know, thinking about their children's best interests. Um, so I hope there would not be a need for a children's rights group, but we absolutely do need to think about how do we include children in the democratic process. And I don't think, you know, saying, oh, you become an adult at 18 and then you get to vote or something like that. I don't think that's actually a good idea because there's lots of children who are you know, politically knowledgeable and active in their, when they're 13, 14, 15, whatever, you know, and making that arbitrary limitation on the basis of how many days you've, you know, how many circles you've gone around the sun, that seems a bit daft. So, uh, but we need to think about this. Uh, you know, a lot of this is just kind of, what does each society think for itself? And, and there's always going to be variation. But you're right, children need to be, uh, to have representation. I will do that. So uh, let me start by thanking all of you for sparing time from your busy schedules and coming here for this talk. Uh, thank you. And thank uh, you for bothering to listen to <laughs> ranting laugh. <laughs> and uh, thanks again to our uh, co-organizers, uh, Tactical Technology Collective and Hasgeek, uh, for all the support on the event. Uh, thanks in particular to Denise from my team for uh, all the coordination uh, and uh, finally thanks to Smiley for the excellent talk. Uh, I learned a lot and I hope all of you did too. Uh, unfortunately we had the coordination challenge so there is no hot coffee and tea waiting. Uh, mm -hmm. Hopefully batches will be prepared and you will get uh, some coffee and tea hopefully but there is uh, a snack, some samosa and jalebi so Let's call the formal proceedings for the evening to a close and uh, I hope you have one-on-one -on -one time with Smiley. <laughs>